Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Parkersburg. It's the beginning of a new year, one in which hope is ever before us. We leave behind a difficult year and yet step forward in the confidence of God's love for us. Each of us should be praying for a happier, more prosperous new year. With those thoughts in mind, let us pray. God, thank you for the privilege, even online, of coming into your presence, of gathering as a congregation of people to say that we love you, we adore you, we lift our hearts before you in praise, and thank you for loving us the way that you have. We pray for your watch care in this new year, and for those who have suffered because of this past year, we pray for health, and we pray for restoration uh, in, in so many ways, and we pray, God, that in this new year that we will find a, a new release and, and be able to come out and serve you with, with uh, joy. And, uh, and find a time when we can be together uh, in more meaningful congregational activities and worship services. And we know, God, that you're going to bless us with your presence, and we're going to be excited to be with you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Did you all get to see the uh, star? The, they were calling it the Christmas star that was in the sky last week. I know that some people uh, tried to do it and, and we had some overcast nights, but I had um, pictures from friends of ours that live elsewhere, live out of West Virginia, that got some beautiful pictures of that star. And to do that, they probably had to use something that I have here. I have some binoculars. And what binoculars are good for is that when you look through them, it brings the object that you're looking at so much closer. So if you had been looking at the star, it would have been very small, but if you use the binoculars, it could have been a little bit closer. And if you had had something like a scope or a telescope, it would have even been better to magnify it, to help you see it closer. I know sometimes when, when we go, when Pastor Rich and I go on trips, he likes to uh, photograph wildlife. And often I will take my binoculars and I'll be looking on the mountains and across the fields and I'll be looking to try to find different animals and then he will use his camera to even bring it up closer so he can just get that perfect shot. You know, binoculars and things like that can teach us something. We all know that having a Bible is a good thing. 
And some of you, I believe, got some Bibles for Christmas. And it's good to have a Bible of your own. It's good to have a Bible that you carry back and forth to church. It's good that when the pastor or someone says to look in this, you know, in this chapter or this book of the Bible and you read it, it's good to do that. But it's more important to look closely at what the Bible says. Do you know why? Do you know what that is? Because the Bible is full of things that tell us how we should act and how we should live and how we should be and how we should love. For instance, um, it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So when somebody does something to you that really makes you mad and you just want to let them have it, you can think, no, the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, it says things such as um, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. So what does that mean? What does that mean? That means when I'm trying to decide what I should do or what I shouldn't do, and I'm decide, trying to make some big decisions, what I think are big decisions in my life, I can just think about what feels good and what that, or I can think, wait, I need to look to God and have him tell me what I should do and have him direct me. Those are things that we need to do. It says things such as, Honor your father and mother. Wow. It says things such as, um, if, we, if we think on God, that he will give us a peace in our heart. That he'll make us. It talks about, don't worry about things. It, all of those kinds of things are right here in the Bible. But in order to know that, we need to look at it closely. And not only look at it closely, we need to listen to teachers and to our pastors so we can understand it. And we need to memorize it. So when things happen, which happen every day in our life, then we can think, wait, God's word says to do this. So I hope that you just won't carry your Bible, but that you'll look closely at it and learn what it says.
Today, I'd like to talk with you about a discovery that changed a man. Better than that, it changed a nation. While this will be a true story, it's an old story. It's more than 2,500 years old. But the story is more relevant today than it was back then. The story involves a missing book and a king. King Josiah began a project to restore the rundown cluttered temple that had been deserted during King Manassas's evil reign. During the renovation, Hekeliah, the high priest, found a copy of the Book of the Law of Moses. What was that book? Perhaps Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? Maybe there were some parchments that contained other Old Testament books. The book he discovered was that which would eventually become our Bible. He carried the scrolls to Shapan, the scribe, who read the scrolls, reported the find to the King Josiah, and read them to him. Listen to these words. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. 2 Kings 22, verse 8. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. From that simple statement comes one of the most interesting happenings in the whole Old Testament. The discovery of the book led to a blessed king, a spiritual revival in Judah, and prosperity among the nations. I believe this story is relevant because that book is still waiting for you to discover it. Unless you've waded into the depths of God's word, you cannot begin to imagine the rich treasures that await you. The Bible's not a magical book, but it contains the words of God Almighty just for you. The Bible's not a novel or a book of fiction, science, or history. Rather, it's the experience of humanity with God's revelation of himself. The Bible was not written to be placed on a coffee table or on a shelf, but poured over by you and me for the purpose of our knowing God's expectations of us as to how to live in the world. George Barna, the Christian guru, informs us that only about one-third of Christians read their Bibles in a given week. Let me tell you that stat again. About one-third of Christians read their Bibles in a given week. That has stayed consistent for the past decade. However, of those two-thirds who seldom open their Bibles, the rate of not reading has climbed by 10%. That means that if you seldom open your Bible, the chances of you ever doing so are growing less and less. Well, you can better answer that. How long has it been since you last opened the Bible and let God speak to your heart? Why are non-readers reading with less frequency? I have a theory. I believe that too many Christians have bought into a cultural religion of family and church buildings and friends and activities while neglecting a relationship with Jesus Christ and a desire to hear from Him. We like our worship style. We love our socials. Some of our closest friends attend the same church. We're comfortable and people like us and accept us. Yet, too many of us remain ignorant of God's expectations and have failed at developing a personal, accountable relationship with Him that leads to, hear this list, growing in interpersonal relationship skills with people, producing a healthy self-image that can engage others and ourselves in love, building financial security for themselves and for their families, mastering an ethical lifestyle that promotes justice for all, fostering a genuine stewardship of all God's gifts, including but not limited to our planet, our possessions, our economy, our families, and our very souls. Now that's a tall order, but that's the treasure of God's Word. And that's the treasure that the king learned when a book was discovered. That story, of course, is in the Bible. If you'll follow along in 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 3 through 13, as I read. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, son of uh, Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, 
and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. That's Ash Broadwater and the other ushers. Have them entrust it to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple. And have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dressed stone to repair the temple. But they need not account for the money entrusted them because they are honest in their dealings. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors of the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. Shaphan read it, or read from it, in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Ahiakam, son of Shaphan, Abkor, son of Melchiah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Isaiah, uh, the king's attendant. Verse 13, Go and inquire the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Well, King Josiah was born during the one of the dark times in Israel's history, and for years the people were mixing pagan practices with their worship of God. They disregarded God's call to remain separate and distinct as his people. During this time, pagan priests had taken over worship in the temple. Offerings to Baal and other gods were being made. The people were turning to mediums and spiritualists for guidance. They sought out idols for their homes. The people were literally lost in their spiritual confusion. They no longer heard the clear call of God. In all their confusion, they literally forgot God's word. They had stored the book of the law in some dark closet and forgot it even existed. Well, in time, the temple fell in disrepair and the word of God was in storage, forgotten, no longer read by the priests, until one day when Hilkiah the priest discovered it. He went to Shaphan the scribe and said, look what I have found. And Shaphan was so excited, he said, this must be shown to the king. The discovery of the book led King Josiah to make sweeping reforms in Judah. And those reforms began with the king himself. The next chapter begins to tell the story of ridding the nation of false religions and a movement of spiritual revival that blanketed the nation. Well, you know of my interest in family history. I've made a lifelong pursuit of knowing my roots. I have some Bibles that belong to family members, and they're precious to me. I, I love having them. And you can tell much about a person by their Bible. My grandmother's Bible was used to record family births and marriages and deaths. There are numerous newspaper clippings that contain obituary notices and other news about people in the little farming community where she lived. It's like a treasure hunt going through all the pieces of paper inserted between the pages. My mother's Bible contains notes from Bible studies and sermons. Her Bible was well-worn and many passages were underlined. I have two Bibles that belong to my dad, one a Masonic Bible and one a Living Bible, with a paraphrase. There are no notes. There are no newspaper clippings. There are no underlined passages. In fact, both of his Bibles are in like new condition. I have 25 Bibles on my library shelf here in front of me. A couple of them are gifts and they're not used for reading. Many of them are study Bibles or alternate translations used for study purposes. I have a preaching Bible, large print, and I have a Bible that was given to me by my parents when I graduated from high school. Its cover is torn. There are many passages underlined and notes are in the margins. There are also words of wisdom that were shared by preachers that I found meaningful and I wrote them down. What would I find if I picked up your Bible? 
Does your Bible show that it has been used? I suppose with regular wear, a Bible may last five years before needing to be replaced. Does your Bible show that you have an interaction with its author? Underline passages where you found meaning. Notes from sermons or books which spoke to you. Prayers written to God asking for his help. You see, the Bible is one of God's revelations of himself to you. As Baptists, we sometimes identify ourselves as people of the book. Not that we worship the Bible, but that the Bible holds a special place for us individually and corporately. It was written by men divinely inspired. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It reveals the principles whereby God judges us. It is the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. And the criteria by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. King Josiah found that neither he nor his people were living in obedience to God. The rediscovery of God's word resulted in three things. First, Josiah heard the scripture read. It was not treated as a piece of antiquity or a rarity to be admired. It was read. Those who truly honor God's word study their Bible daily and feed on it and walk by the light that it gives. Second, Josiah responded to the message of the book. He was so moved by what he heard that he tore his clothes in grief and in repentance. He was ashamed of the sin of his people and afraid of the wrath of God. He was aware of how bad the kingdom really had become because he knew all about the idolatry and all about the immorality that the people practiced. It's difficult to come into the presence of a holy God, even if it's just his revelation of himself in writing and not be changed. Finally, we're told that Josiah read the book to all the people. He gathered all the officials and ministers together at the temple, and instead of making a speech, he read the book to them. He obeyed the words of the book and began making reforms in the temple and in the nation. You see, people armed with the word of God change communities. Say that again. People armed with the word of God change communities. They raise morality and ethics. They make disciples of all nations. Do you need to rediscover the book of the law? The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The Lord told Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The poet said, I entered the world's great library doors, I crossed their acres of polished floors, I searched and searched their stacks and nooks, and settled at last on the book of books. My challenge to you in this new year is to rediscover the book of books. Put your Bible next to your chair and read it daily for at least 10 minutes. 30 is preferable. Start in Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament, if you're not accustomed to regular reading. And as you read, ask yourself, so what? What does this mean to me? What am I going to do about this? What is God telling me? Spend some time daily reading your Bible and simply let God speak to you. I guarantee that he will comfort you, care for you, convict you, correct you, challenge you, and call you into a life so transformed that you will ask yourself, why did it take so long for me to take up this great book? I look forward to hearing your experiences. Let's pray. God, reveal to yourself, reveal yourself to us anew. Open our hearts to your word. Help us to find therein a living, loving relationship with you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.